Amor, Amadis of Gaul, by Vasco de Libera, translated by Robert Southey. Book Three, Chapter Six. How the Knights of the Serpents embarked for Gaul, and fortune led them, where they were placed in great peril of their lives by treachery, and the power of Archelaus, the Enchanter. And how being delivered, they embarked and continued their voyage, and also how Don Galior and Norundel came by chance that way seeking adventures, and of what befell them. Some days King Perion abode in the forest to rest. Then seeing that the wind was fair, they put to sea, thinking soon to be in Gaul. But the wind soon changed and made the sea rage, so that after five days the storm obliged them to return back to Great Britain, to a distant part of the coast. There, while the weather continued, and while their men took in fresh water, they rode into the country to learn where they were, taking three squires with them, but leaving Gandalin to wait for them in the galley, because he was well known. They rode up a glen, and reached a plain, and proceeded not far before they came to a fountain, whereat a damsel was letting her palfrey drink. Richly clad was she, and over her garments she wore a scarlet cloak with gold buttons, and the buttonholes worked with gold. Two squires and two damsels were in her company, with falcons and dogs for sport. She, seeing their arms, knew that they were the knights of the serpents, and went towards them with a show of much joy and saluted them courteously, making signs that she was dumb, whereat they were grieved, seeing how fair she was, and of what courteous demeanour. She went up to him of the golden helmet, and embraced him, and would have kissed his hand, and then by signs she invited them to be her guests that night. But they were not understanding her signs. She tokened to her squire to explain them. They seeing her good will, and that it was now too late, rode with her in full confidence, and came to a goodly castle, so that they held the damsel as very rich, seeing she was mistress thereof. When they entered, they found enough servants to welcome them, and sundry dames and damsels, who all regarded the dumb damsel as their lady. Their horses were taken from them, and they were led up to a rich chamber about twenty cubits from the ground, and then they were disarmed, and rich garments brought them, and after they had talked to the dumb damsel, and with the others, supper was brought, and they were well served. The damsels then retired, but presently they returned with many candles, and with stringed instruments to delight them, and when it was time to sleep, they again retired. The dumb damsel had ordered three rich and goodly beds to be prepared in that chamber, and their arms were laid by the bedside, so they lay down and fell asleep, like men who were fatigued. Now you must know that this chamber was made with great cunning, for the floor did not fasten into the walls, but was supported upon an iron screw like a wine-press, and fitted into a frame of wood, so that it could be lowered or raised from below by turning an iron lever. So when they awoke in the morning, they had been let down twenty cubits low, and perceiving no light, but yet hearing the stir of people above them, they marvelled greatly, and rose from bed, and felt for the door and windows, but when they found them, and put their hands through, they felt the wall of the castle, and knew that they were betrayed. Being in this great trouble, a knight appeared at a window above, who was huge of stature and limb, and of a sullen countenance, and in his beard and hair more white hairs than black. He wore a morning dress, and upon his right hand a glove of white cloth that reached to his elbow. You are well lodged there, cried he, and according to the mischief ye have done me, shall be the mercy you shall find, which shall be a cruel and bitter death, and even with that shall I not be revenged for what you did in battle with the false King Luzwade. Know that I am Archelaus, the enchanter. If you have never seen me before, learn to know me now. None ever injured me without my taking vengeance, except only one whom I yet hope to have where I have you and to cut off his hands for the hand which he lopped from me. The damsel was by him, and she pointing to Amadis said, Good uncle, that young one is he of the golden helmet. But they, hearing they were in the power of Archelaus, were in great fear of death, and much were they surprised to hear that dumb damsel speak. This damsel was Dinarda, the daughter of Ardent Canilio, who was expert in all wickedness, 
and had come to that land to contrive the death of Amadis, and for that cause had feigned herself dumb. Knights, said Archelaus, I will cut your heads off and send them to King Aravigo, as some atonement for the disservice ye have wrought him. Then he drew back from the window and closed it, and the chamber remained so dark that they could not see one another. Good sons, then said King Perion, these are the changes of fortune, but we whose office it is to seek adventures must take the evil as well as the good, exerting ourselves to remedy it where we can, and when our strength avails, not trusting in him who will do what is best. Therefore let us repress the grief which you feel for me, and I yet more for you, and commit ourselves patiently to God. The sons, who endured more for him than for their own danger, then knelt before him and kissed his hand, and he gave them his blessing. They remained there all that day without food or drink. When Archelaus had supped and part of the night was gone, he came again to the window with two lighted torches, and with him Dinarda and two old men. "'You knights there,' cried he, "'I suppose you could eat if you had wherewith.' "'Willingly, if you will give it to us,' answered Florestan. He replied, "'If I have any such will, God prevent it. But that you may not be quite disconsolate, instead of food I will give you some news to make amends. Two squires and a dwarf have come to the castle gate, since it was dark, to ask for the knights of the serpents. I have had them seized and thrown into a prison under you. In the morning I will make them tell me who ye are, or else cut them limb from limb. Now this which he said was true, for they in the galley, seeing that the wind was fair, sent Gandalin and the dwarf, and Orfeo, the king's wardrobe-keeper, to seek for the knights, and Darkelaws had taken them thus. Much were Perdion and his sons troubled at these perilous tidings, but Amadis answered, saying, Sure am I that when you know who we are, you will not use us so wrongfully as now. For as you are a knight yourself, you will not hold that for wrong which we did fairly in battle to assist our friends, as we should have done had we been on your side. If there be any worth in you, you ought to esteem us for this, and do us the more honor, being now in your power. You show no courtesy in treating us thus. Who disputes with you? quoth Archelaus. The honor I will do you shall be as I would do to Amadis of Gaul, who is the man in the world I love worst, and on whom I most desire to take my vengeance. Uncle, said Dinarda, as you mean to send their heads to King Aravigo, do not let them die of hunger, but just support life for them, that they may endure more pain. I will, niece, replied Archelaus. Tell me, knights, on your faith, are you most troubled with hunger or thirst? In truth, said they, though meat is of consequence, we are more desirous of drink. Take them a bacon pasty, said he to another damsel, that they may not say I would not relieve them. And then they all withdrew. The damsel, seeing Amadis, how comely he was, and knowing the great feats of chivalry, which he had done in the battle, was moved to pity for him and his comrades, and she put a vessel of water and another of wine into a basket with a bacon pasty, and lowered it by a cord, saying, Take this and be secret. You shall not fare ill if I can help ye. Amadis thanked her much, and she went away. Then they supped and went to bed, bidding their squires, who were with them, keep their arms in readiness where they could find them. For said they, If we do not die of hunger, we will sell our lives dearly. Now Gandalin and Orfeo and the dwarf were cast into a prison underneath the platform, whereon their masters lay. They found there a dame and her husband, and a young knight, their son, who had been confined a year. Gandalin, talking with them, told them how coming in search of the knights of the serpents, he had been seized. "'Holy Mary,' replied the old knight, "'these of whom you speak were well received in this castle, and while they were asleep, Four men entered this prison, and turning that iron lever which you see, lowered down the platform above us, so that they have suffered a great treason. Gandalin, then understanding that his master was in danger of death, said, Let us try and raise it then, else neither they nor we shall ever escape. But if they save themselves, we shall be delivered. 
Then the knight and his son on one side, and Gandalin and Orfeo on the other, began to turn the lever, and the platform began to rise. King Perion, who could not sleep for grief because of his sons, presently felt it, and waking them said, The floor is rising. I know not for what intent. Amadis answered, Let it be for what it will. It is very different to die like knights or like thieves. And they leaped out of bed, and bade their squires arm them. They below turned the lever with great labor and difficulty, till the floor had risen to its place. Then Perion and his sons saw a light through the crevices of the door, whereby they had entered, and they burst it open and rushed out upon the wall where the guards were, and slew and threw down all they met, crying aloud, Gaul, Gaul, the castle is ours. Archelaus, hearing this, was greatly dismayed, thinking that it was the treason of some of his people who had led in the enemy, and he fled naked into a tower, and drew up the stairs after him, which were made like a drawbridge. He feared nothing from his prisoners, thinking they were safe enough, but looking from a window, he saw the knights of the serpents traversing the castle. Then, not daring to descend himself, he called to his men not to fear, for there were but three against them. Some of those who lodged below then began to arm, but the knights who had now cleared the walls went down, and soon so handled them that not a man appeared before them. They in the dungeon, who heard what was doing, cried aloud for help. Amadis knew the dwarf's voice, for he and the dame were in the most fear, and went forthwith to release them, and with great force breaking the iron staples, they burst open the door and set them at liberty. Then searching the buildings round the court, they found their horses, and gave two of Archelaus's to the knight and his son, and to Nardia's palfrey to the dame. And having mounted, the king ordered them to set fire to the dwellings. It began to blaze till all was in one flame, and the fire caught the door of the tower, and the dwarf cried out, Sir Archelaus, take this smoke patiently, as I did when you hung me up by the leg, when you committed the great treason against Amadis. Much was the king pleased to hear how the dwarf scoffed him, and they all laughed to see what plight he was now in for all his force and cunning. Then they rode toward their ship, and looking back from a hill, beheld the castle burning to their great joy. When they were got aboard and were disarmed, the dame knew the king and fell on her knees before him, and he seeing her took her up and embraced her, as one he much loved. Sir, said she, which is Amadis? And when she knew, she would have kissed his feet, but he raised her up, being greatly abashed, and she then told him how she was Darioletta, who had thrown him into the sea and besought his pardon. Dame, quoth he, now know I what before I never knew, for though my foster father told me I was found in the sea, I knew not how it had chanced. That do I indeed pardon, for you did no wrong, for all was for the service of her whom I am bound to serve while I have life. The king took pleasure to talk of those times, and thus cheerfully they sailed till they arrived in Gaul. You have heard how Archelaus was naked in the tower, and because the fire caught the door he could not get out, and the smoke and the heat were so great that he could not help himself. And though he got into a stone vaulted chamber, still the smoke was so thick that he was in great agony. There he remained two days, for the fire continued so fierce that none of his people who survived could enter. But on the third day they could go in, and they went up to him, and found him in such plight that his soul was ready to depart from his body. But pouring water into his mouth, they made him recover, though in great tortures, and took him in their arms to remove him to the town. But when he saw his castle so burnt and ruined, he said in the bitterness of his heart, Ah, Amadis of Gaul, what evil hast thou brought upon me? If I catch thee, I will do such cruelty upon thee, that my heart shall be revenged for all and for thy sake I swear never more to spare the life of any knight whom I take, that if thou shouldest fall again into my hands, thou mayest not escape. Four days he remained in the town. Then he set out in a litter for his castle of Mount Alden with Dinarta, who was so fair, and another damsel, and seven knights to guard them. The second day of their journey was far spent, and on that night they were to reach his castle, when at the skirts of a forest they saw two knights by a fountain, richly armed and well mounted. "'Good uncle,' said Dinarda, "'here are two strange knights, for they were waiting to see what came in the litter.' He raised his head and said to his knights, 
Take your arms, and bring me hither those knights without saying who I am. If they resist, bring me their heads. Now you are to know that these knights were Don Galior and his comrade Nordenel. The knights of Arclos came up to them and bade them leave their arms and go to him in the litter. In God's name, quoth Galior, who is he? Or what is it to him whether we go armed or not? We know not, replied the other, but you had better obey him, or we must take your heads. We are not come to that point yet, quoth Nordenel, that you can do it. Now shall ye see, said they. In the first encounter, two of the knights fell wounded to death. The other five broke their spears, and could not move them from their saddles. Then drew they their swords, and began a fierce battle. But three of them, being overthrown and badly wounded, the other twain durst no longer abide those mortal blows, and rode full speed into the forest. The two companions did not pursue them, but rode up to the litter, which was now deserted by all except two men on horseback. And they raised the curtain, and said, Sir knight whom God curse, is it thus you treat errant knights? If you were armed, we would make you confess that you are a wretch and false to God and the world. But as you are sick, we will send you to Don Grumedan, who shall sentence you as you deserve. When Archelaus heard this, he was sore dismayed, knowing that if Grumedan should seize him, his death was come. But being crafty in all things, he put on a good countenance and said, Certy, sir, much pleasure would you do me in sending me to my cousin and lord, Don Grumedan. But I hold myself unfortunate that you should complain against me, whose only thought and wish is how to serve errant knights. I beseech you, sirs, for courtesy, hear my misfortune, and then do with me as ye please. They, hearing that he was cousin to Don Grumedan, who they loved so well, repented them of their harsh words they had used towards him. Speak on, said they. We will willingly hear you. Know then, sirs, that one day, being armed, I was riding in the forest of the Black Lake, and there I found a dame, who complained to me of wrong which had been done her. I went with her, and recovered for her her right before Count Gunkestra. But as I was returning to my castle, I met that knight whom you have slain, who God curse him, was a perverse man, and he, with two other knights, attacked me to win from me my castle. I defended myself the best I could, but was at last taken. He kept me prisoner for a whole year, and all the honor he showed me was to have these wounds healed. Then showed he the scars to them, for being a brave knight, many were the wounds which he had given and received. At length, sirs, being in despair of otherwise obtaining my liberty, I agreed to give him up my castle, thinking to go afterwards to my cousin Don Grumedan and to my lord King Lisuade, and demand justice against the robber, which now, sirs, without my asking it, you have taken for me more fully than I expected. And if I found no help there, I resolved to go seek Amadis of Gaul or his brother Don Galior, and seek from them that succor which they grant to all who are oppressed. Now because I was so weak as not to ride, he carried me in his litter to have my castle yielded, and the reason why he and those other traitors attacked you was that you might not come up to see who was in the litter, and so learn their villainy. Hearing this, they besought pardon of him for the threats they had used, and asked his name. Gronfiles, I know not if you have heard it heretofore. Yes, quoth Galior, and I know, as your cousin hath told me, that he shows great honor towards all errant knights. God be praised that you know me, he replied. Now I beseech you, take off your helmets and tell me your names also. This knight is Nordenel, sung to King Lisuare, and I am Galior, the brother of Amadis. God be praised, quoth Archelaus, that I have been succoured by such knights. And he looked well at Galior, when they had unhelmed, that he might know him again, and do him a mischief, if ever he had him in his power. I trust in God, sirs, that you may one day be where my will towards you may be satisfied. Tell me now what I shall do. Even whatever is your will, I will proceed then to my castle. God guard you, said they, and they parted. It was night, but the moon shone and he presently struck into a by-path. The two knights resolved to rest by the fountain because their horses were weary. "'As you will,' said Don Galior Squire, "'but there is better lodging ready for you than you are aware of.' "'How so?' Two damsels who came with the knight in the litter have hid themselves in that old building among the briars. Then they alighted and washed their hands and faces at the fountain, and went towards the place, through the thicket and over rubbish. "'Who is hidden here?' cried Galior aloud. 
Bring fire that I may make them come out. When Dinarda heard this, she cried, Mercy, knight, and I will come out. Come out, then, that I may see who you are. Help me, or I cannot. Galior drew nearer. She held out her arms. The moon shone bright, so that he saw her distinctly, and he helped her out. She had on a scarlet petticoat and a white satin cloak, and so fair was she, that Galior had never seen one whom he liked so well. Nor Dindel took the other damsel out, then all went back to the fountain, and there regaled upon what the squires brought, and on what they found upon a sumpter horse of Archelaus. Dinarda was in great fear of Galior, lest he should know how she had betrayed his father and his brothers, and take vengeance, and therefore she looked at him with amorous eyes, and made signs to her damsels, how she admired his beauty. And this she did in hope, to make him love her, thinking that she might be safe. Galior was not slow at comprehending these signs, for he thought of nothing but how he might have her for his mistress. So much was her ill fortune that she, loath as she was, yet seeming nothing coy, yielded that to her enemy which no lover could ever yet attain. Meanwhile Nodandal wooed the damsel with whom he had been beside the fountain, but she replied, You shall never have my love unless my lady Dinarda bids me yield it. Dinarda, quoth Nordandal, what is this daughter of Arden Canileo, who is come to this land to consult with Archelaus the enchanter how they may revenge her father's death? I know not the cause of her coming, but this is Dinarda, and happy may he think himself who wins her love. By this Galior and Dinarda came up, and Nordandal, taking him apart, asked him if he knew who the damsel was. Dinarda, Arden Canileo's daughter whom your cousin Mabilia told us was come to this country to devise the death of Amadis. Galliar mused a while, and answered, I know nothing of her heart, but she seems to love me dearly, and she is the woman who of all that I have seen has pleased me best, and I will not part from her yet. But as we are going to Gaul, I will contrive that Amadis may make her some satisfaction, and so be forgiven. Meantime, Dinarda learned from her damsel what had passed with Nordandal, and how she was discovered. Friend, said she, our wisdom now is not to regard our own wills, but to yield to the necessity. We must feign love for these knights, and yield to them till we can find occasion to escape. That night Galior asked his mistress what was the name of the wicked knight who wanted to slay them. She thought he meant him in the litter, and answered, How is it that when you went up to him in the litter you did not know he was Archelaus? Archelaus, yea, truly, holy Mary, and have I let him escape death with his tricks? When Dinata heard that he was not slain, she greatly rejoiced. But assembling that, she answered, A little while ago, and I would have given my life to save his. But now that you have won my love, and I am in your favor, I wish him dead, for I know he hates you in your lineage. May the ill which he designs you fall upon his own head. And she clipped him in her arms, as if with exceeding love. So they passed that night there in the forest, and on the morrow the knights took each his leman and proceeded towards Gaul. Archelaus, greatly dismayed at what had befallen him, reached his castle at midnight, and ordered the gates to be closed and no person admitted. There had he, his sores healed, designing to be worse than ever, and commit greater wrongs, as is the way of the wicked, who, though God is patient with them, strive not to loose the chains in which the wicked enemy hath bound them till they are cast with them into the pit of hell, as we ought to believe this Archelaus was. Two days on Galior and Nodandal rode with their mistresses towards the port from whence they designed to cross over into Gaul. On the third day they reached a castle, where they resolved to lodge that night, and finding the gate open rode in. The lord of the castle, when he saw them enter, chid his people for leaving the gates open. Howbeit he made good semblance to the knights, and did them much honour, though against his will, for his name was Ambades, and he was cousin to Archelaus, and he knew Dinarda his niece, who told him that she was forced by Galior. The mother of this Ambades wept in secret with Dinarda, and said she would have the knight slain. Let not such folly possess you and my uncle, quoth Dinarda. And she then related how they had discomforted the seven knights. Tomorrow I and the damsel will lag behind, and let them go through the gate. Then the bridge may be drawn up, and we shall be safe. Thus they resolved to do. Ambades feasted the knights well, and lodged them well, 
but he could not sleep all that night. So much was he dismayed at having two such men in his castle. In the morning he rose and armed himself, and said he would accompany his guests some way. For this, said he, is my office to seek adventures. We thank you, host, said Galior. So they armed and placed their mistresses on their palfreys and rode forth. But their host and their mistresses remained behind, and as soon as they and their squires were out, drew up the bridge so that the scheme succeeded. Ambades immediately dismounted and went upon the wall and saw how the knights were looking to see any one of whom they might demand their damsels. Get ye gone, ye ill and false guests, quoth he. God confound ye and give ye as bad a night as ye gave me. Your mistresses, with whom you thought to make merry, shall tarry with me. How now, host, said Galior, have you so well entertained us, and do you now commit this great disloyalty to detain our damsels by force? More joy if it were so, replied Ambades, but it was you, their enemies, who held them by force, and they stay here freely. Let them show themselves, and we shall see if it be so. They shall, not to satisfy you, but to show how they hate you. Dinarda then appeared upon the wall. Dinarda, my lady, said Galior, this knight says you remain there willingly, and I cannot believe it because of the great love that is between us. If I manifested love towards you, Dinarda replied, it was only in fear, for I being the daughter of Arden Canaleo, and you brother to Amadis, how was it possible that I could love you? and especially when you would have carried me into Gaul, into the power of my foes. Go away, Galior, if I have pleased you, do not thank me, nor ever think of me except as your enemy. Stay where you are, quoth Galior, with the bad fortune which God grant thee. From such a root as Archelaus there can only come such shoots. And you, said Nodandal, in great vexation to his mistress, what will you do? The will of my lady. Confound her will, quoth he, and that of the fellow who has deceived us. Such as I am, cried Ambades, I should think it no praise to conquer two such as ye. If you are such a knight, quoth Nordandal, come out and fight me, you on horseback and I afoot. If you kill me, you will rid Archelaus of a mortal enemy. If I conquer, you shall give us the damsels. What a fool thou art, Ambades replied. I think nothing of both. And what should I do of these singly on foot, and I being mounted? For what you say of my lord Archelaus, he would not give one straw for twenty such as thee, and thy comrade. And then he took a Turkish bow, and began to let fly at them. They drew back and went their way, saying that the wickedness of Archelaus extended to all his race, and laughing at what had passed. On the fourth day they reached a seaport called Alfied, and taking ship arrived in Gaul at a place where Amadis and Florestan were with King Perion. Amadis and Florestan were walking together when they saw the vessel put to land, and they went towards it to learn news. Presently they saw Galior and Nordandal in the boat. Holy Mary, quoth Amadis, here is our brother Galior. Know you who is with him? Nordandal and his companion, King Lisuare's son, a right good knight. And so he proved himself in the island of Monganza but he was not acknowledged for his son till after the battle with the seven kings, and then Lisuati made it known because of his great worth. Glad was Amadis of his coming, because he was Oriana's brother, and Durin had said how she loved him. By this the knights landed, and they four joyfully embraced, and went forthwith to King Perion, who embraced Nordandal, and led them to the queen. Now Amadis had before resolved to go in quest of adventures, that he might redeem his lost name, and had fixed the fourth day for his departure. Accordingly he spake to the king and his brethren, saying, that it behooved him to leave them, and that he would set forth on the morrow. Son, replied Perion, God knows the want of you which I shall feel, but not for that will I prevent you from gaining honour and the praise of prowess, as you have ever done. Sir brother, quoth Galior, if it were not for a quest which I and Nordandal have undertaken, we would bear you company, but we must needs accomplish it, or pass a year and a day in the pursuit, according to the custom of Great Britain. Son, said Perdion, what is your quest, if it may be known? Sir, replied Galior, we publicly undertook it, and this it is. Know, sir, that in the battle which we had with the seven kings of the islands, 
there were on the side of king Lisuarte three knights all bearing serpents for their arms all alike but their helmets were different the one being white one purple and one golden and these three did such wonders in arms that we were all astonished especially he of the golden helmet whose goodness in arms i think cannot be peered certes it is that but for these king Lisuarte would not have had the victory when the battle was over they left the field so secretly that they could not be known and it is to find them out that we have undertaken we have heard here of these knights answered perdion god give you good tidings of them but amadis took his father and florestan apart and said sir i shall depart early and i think after i am gone you should discover the truth to galior that he may not go on a vain search show him the arms which he will know for if he learns not the secret from us none else can tell him that night was their great feastings made but all were heavy for the loss of amadis who was going they knew not whither on the morrow after mass they rode out with amadis who had taken company with him none but gandalin and the dwarf to whom the queen gave money enough to suffice his master for a year don florestan requested to go with him but that he would not grant for two reasons that he might have more leisure to think of his lady and that in attempting great adventures he alone might perish or acquire the glory they rode a league together then amadis took leave of his father and brethren and went his way when they returned king perion took galior and nordandal aside and said to them you have undertaken to find out that of which you can learn no tidings in the world except it be only here i bless god that he has guided you thus to save you from the labour of a fruitless search then led he them to a chamber where the arms hung there said he is the white helmet which i wore and florestern's purple one and the golden helmet of amadis well did they remember them for they bore the dints of that battle and often they had looked at them on that day sometimes rejoicing that king Lisuarte had such aid at other times envying the prowess of their masters god and you sir said galior have shown us great favour in saving us from this search it was our intent to seek those knights everywhere and if they would not discover themselves we should have fought with them till death to prove that though in the general battle they did the best it would be otherwise in single fight nor dandel then begged those arms of the king which he courteously granted then told he them in what peril they had been at the castle of arcalaus and by what adventure they had escaped the tears came into galliar's eyes for grief at that recital and he in his turn told what had chanced to him in nordandal with archelaus and how the enchanter had escaped and of their host ambades so galliar and nordandal abode fourteen days with king perion then taking the arms of the serpents they embarked for great britain and took those arms to the palace to show how they had achieved their quest well were they welcomed by the king and all the court sir if it please you said galliar let me be heard in presence of the queen forthwith they all went to the queen's apartment and galliar and his companion kissed her hand and then he said ye know sirs that i and nordandal went in quest of the knights of the serpents blessed be god we have accomplished it without difficulty as nordandal shall show you then nordandal took in his hand the white helmet and said sir know you this helmet well yea answered Zuare. many times did i see it when i wished it to be seen king perion who loves you well bore it on his head that day the purple one was on florestan's here is the golden helmet he who wore it and who did such service as none other could have done is amadis if i say truth or not you are the best witness for you were often among them in the battle they enjoying now the fame and you the victory then they related all that had happened and concerning archelaus and how he had escaped by calling himself grumedan's cousin at that they all laughed and old grumedan also saying he was happy that they had found such a kinsman for him Lisuarte then inquired much concerning King Perion. Trust me, sir, said Nordandal, there is no king in the world of equal territories who is his peer. He will lose nothing by his sons, quoth Grumedin. Theretofore the king answered nothing, because he would not praise Galliar to his face, and was at that time little pleased with his brethren. Howbeit he ordered the arms to be hung upon the crystal arch of his palace, where the arms of the other famous men were placed. End of chapter 6